Okay, so anterior shoulder pain. Now, the, the other thing I want to know from you as well is what helps it, what relieves it. Is there anything like, so how, long, so how old has it been? Probably two months. Okay, so it's been two months. And it's progressively got worse after, over two months or is it plateaued out? Uh, progressively got worse. Okay, all right. So, so in that time, have you had any treatment? No. No, typical therapist, right? Okay. <laughs> so, which is, once again, typical. <laughs> um, so, given that, is there anything that you've found that actually helps it, apart from not using it? Um, working on it myself occasionally. Okay, right. Stretching. Okay, so self treatment. Yeah. And that hasn't worked, has it? Not, 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 not really effective. Okay, all right. So, one of the things I want to know about uh, a condition when they come in, especially if it's soft tissue, is its irritability. Okay. So you all probably remember irritability, do you? So we deal with it every day. So, is it a low irritability? Is it a mild? Is it a severe? Or is it highly irritable? Okay. So, irritability. What I mean by irritability, everyone knows what I mean by it? I'll put it into perspective. means that, let's say, for instance, Stuart gets up in the morning and he I don't know, cuts the toast, he gets bread and he actually has to slice the, the toast up. And that aggravates it, okay? And it aggravates it to the point where it's actually really quite severe, it's quite nasty, okay? It then takes probably a good hour or two for it to settle down, okay? I would class that as something that's highly irritable, as opposed to him getting up at the start of the day, cutting the toast, taking the dog for a walk, driving his car, doing some massage, and then starting to get a little bit of awareness about it. The pain not being too bad, and if he stops, it settles down quickly, okay? So the difference between having something low irritable and high irritable means what to us in treatment. So if he had a highly irritable Condition? Conservative. Conservative, definitely. Yeah. Okay. So the chances of making this worse are higher if it's highly irritable. It's as simple as that. Okay. The structures that we work with, okay, if they're irritable, if we work on them, nine times out of ten, we'll make them worse. We will flare them. Okay. So then our approach to him will be different. And I'll speak a little bit more about that when we actually do the treatment. Um, component. Alright, so we know the location, we know the onset, now the type. Type of pain, type of discomfort, type of... Just a dull. Dull. Dull pain. Dull pain. Does it refer? So it's just in the anterior shoulder. Damn. Right. <laughs> so it doesn't refer at all. Well, it hasn't referred. It, so. If you sleep on that shoulder, does it much different. So it's not something that I go, oh, I've got to swap size and it's painful and so forth. Okay. All right. So at this stage, I'd say, you'd say it's a mild irritation. Okay. I wouldn't say it's high and I wouldn't say it's low. It's certainly there because he's got awareness when he gets up in the morning. So that's, that's really important. Okay. Now, have you had a history of this in the past? No. So you've never had shoulder pain before? I've had shoulder pain, but not. But not this type of shoulder pain? Type. What was the shoulder pain that you had in the past? Um, more chest pain. More chest pain? Okay. Oh, oh, okay, so... Okay, right, okay, so delayed onset muscle soreness type stuff. Okay, so you've not had any significant pain that's been ongoing. Okay, so at the moment we have... Well, I have in my mind a couple of differential diagnoses that I need to either confirm or deny with what's going on with Stuart. Has anyone here got anything that they would like to ask him to know more about his condition? When did it happen? Like, what, two months ago, how did it start? Just, uh, just, just like slow that. onset, just from, um, I suppose I've just set up a new business, so I'm mm. working full time and mm -hmm. making it out to the clinic to treat. Mm -hmm. That's a slowly progressing thing. Okay. Good question. So what does that tell you now? Well, I was just curious to know whether it was a trauma that... Yep whether it was of a direct, indirect, or an eye for use. And, sorry, what was your name? Well, you mentioned it before. Oh, you said overuse, okay. Overuse yeah, so we want to also classify where he's at with this as well. 
Did he just recently bump into the wall and it's been sore since then? Or has it progressively got worse over time? Which then falls into our overuse basket, doesn't it? How many of you here suffer from overuse problems or overuse injuries yourself as therapists? So those of you not putting up your hand, what's the secret? <laughs> you get treatment? Yeah, there it is. That's what it is for sure. Yeah, OK. <laughs> All right, so now I'm at a point where I really do need to go down the road of confirming or denying what his problem is. But I also need to know what could be the contributing factors from other areas as well. Now, the only other thing that I haven't asked you is what's your, what's your activity status at the moment? Are you playing sport or you got hobbies or anything like that? No, no sport at the moment. No sport at the moment, OK. And given the fact that you, you've just started a new business, meaning you're doing yep. more hands-on work, you've, have you increased your the amount of soft tissue you do, work you're doing? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, how much would you say? Uh, as a percentage, probably 50 to 60%. Okay. All right. 50 to 60%. Okay. So that's a, that's, a, that's a fair jump. I don't know about you. I remember when I first started off and I was seeing, oh, maybe half a dozen people a week and I jumped to about 15. And that's, that's a big jump. And what do you think happened? Forearm pain straight away. Okay. So yeah, and it took a good five, six weeks before my body actually got used to doing that. And I was lucky enough that I did get treatment because I think if I didn't get treatment, things would have continually got worse and progressed, okay? Which they do with overuse injuries. So now I need to take Stuart through a series of range of movement tests. Now you, you, should, you guys should all know this, but the, the idea of this, this case study workshop is to put it into perspective for someone who actually has got a problem. Because otherwise, when you were first taught this, it would have just said, take them through the range, how does that feel? Yeah, that's good. And that's not really knowing what's positive and what's not. Okay, so we've got someone here who's got shoulder pain, which is good. So now we want to know what's going on. Now, we could do a full postural overview of him. And I'm not going to do that. Because as much as the posture does have a, be uh, a bearing over it, I think... At the moment, what I'd like to do is just try and isolate as much as I can of whereabouts he's getting the pain and what actually aggravates it in terms of his range of movement. So we're going to look at his passive, we're also going to look at his active, and we're also going to look at his resisted. Beautiful. Okay. And then we might throw in the odd orthopaedic test or specific test for him. So, uh, Stuart, do you mind popping your top off or are you, are you a bit shy? I'm a bit shy. Oh, okay. All right, so just sitting there. So the first thing I do when I'm looking at uh, when I'm looking at their uh, range of movement is looking at their good side, then looking at their obviously symptomatic side. And the reason we do that is for what? Comparison. Comparison. We've got a master, if you like. We've got something to compare to. He doesn't have shoulder pain on this side. But that's not to say that he actually doesn't have problems with his shoulder either. But he's here to see, whoops, he's here to see us today about this one. So the first thing we're going to do is we're just going to take you through a bit of glenohumeral flexion. I don't have to go through the whole dynamics of it in terms of what the movement is, do we? Because I think we all know what the movements are. <coughs> so the first thing I do is I actually take them through the range. Okay? The reason being I do that is because most of the people that come through to see me don't know what flexion is. So if I say, can you flex your shoulder? I'll just go like that. Okay. So it gives them an opportunity to know what I'm actually looking for. I stabilise the top of his glenohumeral um, and just taking it up. Now, what I want to know is where he feels tight, okay, to me and whether, and whether or not he actually feels a restriction himself. So I'm taking him up into flexion. Now, let me know if you feel any pain or discomfort. That's okay. So he's getting tight about here. And as I wind it up, it gets more so. But that's, that's, a good, that's a good range of movement. I wouldn't say there's anything wrong with that. So we'll look through on this. So getting to here, I can feel tightness already. Now, just let me know if you feel anything. Just tightness. Yeah. Now, whereabouts do you feel that tightness? Okay, all right. So you're feeling down the outside there. 
Check this one again. Now, do you feel tightness in the same area? Or? Not, really. Not really. Okay, so passively, when I'm moving this joint, what am I testing? Yeah, range of movement of the joint. Did you say the joint? Great, okay. Yeah, we are doing that, but also, we're also testing what? The stretch of the muscles as well, okay? Yes, it is joint, absolutely. And if you look at any of the orthopedic books, it will be passive range of movement is joint. But I don't use it for that. Well, not unless I get a positive sign on a joint, but I very rarely do. But I use it to test where does he feel the soft tissue restriction? Not whereabouts does he feel the joint pain? Because unless he has a significant pathology, meaning of a glenohumeral nature, he probably won't get a positive sign. Okay? Does everyone understand that? So I'm assessing him, one, yes, for the joint, but two, for his soft tissue restriction. Okay? Beautiful. So lat dorsi and tricep fascia. Okay? And we will come back to lat dorsi later because it's extremely important muscle in terms of treating any shoulder can problem. Okay, so that's as far as I'm concerned, that's his passive arrangement for his flexion. I'm happy with the fact that he's got tightness there. Because that's treatment protocol number one for me is his lat dorsi and his triceps fascia. Because as far as I'm concerned, that's a positive for me. Others would just rush through it and say, yep, no, that's all right. No joint pain? Fine, let's move on. Okay. Now, do you reckon you could manage flexion yourself without me helping you? <laughs> do you want both arms at once? No, just the one. Just the so one. start with this one. Beautiful. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. Can't wait. Okay. Yep, that's okay. No pain? No pain. All right. Coming over this side now. Okay, how's that? Okay, so he's feeling it on the top. Okay, so he's feeling it here. Here being anterior shoulder, here being the pain that you usually get. Yep. Okay, right there. Yep. G'day, Sam. All right, so we have active range of movement and positive, uh, passive range of movement. We have a positive on both. So he's having anterior shoulder pain on his active flexion. Okay. So we're able to, what? Reproduce his pain straight away, which is great. Because I'd say that, yeah, most people come in the door, that doesn't happen, but that's great for this case study. All right, so next port of call is, let's do some resisted um, movements. So once again, so everyone's familiar with resisted range, uh, resisted uh, strength tests. So the idea is, um, for me, is that I liked them start? I liked the client to start off with a mild contraction and build through it, all right? So that we are recruiting more as we go through the uh, the, the test. So just gently push up against me. Bit more, bit more, <coughs> bit more, bit more, bit more. Okay, so I can beat him. Of course, I'm going to beat him because I've got my whole body weight. But what I want to see is whether or not he is able to resist me whether or not he has actually got strength in opposition to what I'm, um, in opposition to my resistance. Okay, now pushing up again. So I'm going to do it in a few ranges. And again, one more. Okay, any pain on that? No? And just one more up here. Now, why is it good that I test him through all the ranges? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. We might, he might only be painful here, okay? He might not be painful there. Why? Because we're loading it just a little bit differently. Or recruiting a little bit differently. Okay, push up against here. Push, 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 push. Okay, that's all right. Strength's okay. Not a problem. Pain? Pain. Anterior? Anterior. Same place? Yep. On the red dot? <laughs> yep. Okay. All right, push up again. What about that? No pain. And just up there, Stuart. That's all right? Pain. Pain. Yep. Same there? Yep. Okay. So he's got pain early, mid, no, and then end, which actually goes against 
the painful arc. But anyway, that's fine. Okay, so now we're able to, well, we've got a couple of positive signs, which is good. Um, can someone do a favour for me? Someone keep note on my positive signs. So passive range of movement. <coughs> he has tightness in lat dorsi, triceps. Anyone want to volunteer to do this? Or will I just do it? You've done it. Thank you. What's your name? David. Thanks, David. Good. So we have positive on his active range of movement, anterior shoulder, and we also have a positive on his resisted range of movement. Beautiful. Great. Terrific. Okay. Now let's go to abduction. So once again, I'll uh, take off here. So once again, just let me know if you feel any pain, discomfort, or tightness. So I'm not feeling any resistance on this at all. That's okay? Yep. Good. And there's no resistance on that either. Any pain on that? A little bit of stretch early on. But okay. A little bit of stretch early on. Where? About there. About there. Whereabouts? Okay, down through there. Okay. Which is obviously giving us weight for now. <clears throat> Let's get you to do the, the active. So just up through. Okay. How's that feel? No problems, this one. Okay. Anything on that? No. No. Okay. So <clears throat> with the tightness that he's feeling, once again, that's just going back to that passive range of movement that he had with flexion. The resisted abduction. Now, um, is everyone familiar with painful arc? The painful arc, 70 to 120, I think it is. Yep, yep. So in terms of um, shoulder pain, most people, if it's of a soft tissue nature, will have pain starting at that 70 and maybe through to that 120. And then they get past and then it drops away, okay? So for us, we want to get a bit of an idea of when he's getting pain, if he's getting pain at all, okay, with these um, rotator cuff muscles. And this should bring it up if it does. Now, just pushing up against me. That's all right. And again. That's all right. Yep. Be vocal. That's yep. all right. And that's all right. So strength is still not a problem. Okay, push up. Feel alright? Yep. <coughs> Bit weak. Getting weak. Getting weaker. Okay. And one more. Yeah, that's alright. Yeah, you're recruiting everything but your shoulder <laughs> there, aren't you? <laughs> How's your opposite lat dorsi on that one? Okay, so you, uh, what? We would say about, yeah, <coughs> 110, you were getting pain? David? Yeah. Yep, okay. Whoops. All right, so that's abduction, that's flexion. And uh, what we need to go through now would be the external and internal rotators. Now, why are they important if we're talking about the rotator cuff muscles? They all attach into the shoulder girdle. Beautiful. Yep. But it is usually between the internals and the externals where the fight begins. Okay? Which ones are tight? Which ones are overloaded? All right. So for, for Stuart, this is where it gets interesting for me because I really want to find out what structures are at play here. <coughs> and I'm hoping this will confirm and deny what I think at the moment. No, what am I doing? Wrong one. Okay, so we're going to do <coughs> external rotation, passive. Once again, I'm... Stabilising the glenohumeral, so we're just coming up. And range of movement, yep, relatively good. Any pain on that? Just feels uncomfortable. Okay. What would I need to be aware of doing external rotation to? Especially to do with his joint, the glenohumeral. Yep. And that there may not be a history of instability. 
okay? So a dislocation. So he may then get a, God forbid, a positive apprehensive test. So meaning that the shoulder, okay, or the glenohumeral will orientate anteriorly. Everyone knows what I mean by anterior instability of the shoulder? Someone has fallen outstretched with their arm, dislocated the shoulder, sublaxed it, okay? Then you'll find that they will develop an anterior instability of the shoulder, okay? So a looseness, a laxity. And those that do, when you take them back into external rotation, which is your orthopedic test for apprehension, they may find, oh no, don't go any further. All right, All right this will be interesting, okay. So he's getting tight here already. All right, how's that feeling there, Stuart? Okay, so feeling it across there? Yep. yep. So if I go there? Yep. yep. Okay, all right. So if he's getting pain there and I'm externally rotating, what do you think that might be? It's all right, we'll come back to it. I'll leave that one. Okay, so now we're doing resisted range of movement. Now, you would, you would say this test is predominantly, if we're looking at a soft tissue, testing a soft tissue, what would we be testing here? So it's, we're doing external rotation. So we're testing what? Internal rotators. Internal rotators for what? Length. Beautiful, okay, definitely. That's exactly what we're doing. But we may also get some action in the external rotators as well. Now, what I'll get you to do, Stuart, yep. is just coming back into external rotation for us. So I just want to get a picture of his active, okay? All right, back down again, do it again. Okay, back down again, up again. So I like to do external rotation at least three times just to get a good idea of what coordination they have. Because most people who do external rotation do uh, that sort of stuff, okay? So I like to find whether or not they've got any compensations made. So meaning that if they're trying to do external rotation, they recruit other muscles or other movements to do external rotation. It's the same with people who have restrictions in their flexion. They go, whoop, that way. So they add abduction. All right, so let's go out this one, Stuart. Okay, so he's, there's no doubt that he's a bit restricted. I don't know if you can see that because of him. So yeah, so he's probably about five degrees short on the other side. Now, do you feel anything there? Any tightness, any pain? Or, yeah, no? just tightness again through there. Okay, right, right. That's on. the only one I'm pushing it. Pushing it, okay, through there. All right, let's just do some resisted. So gently pushing up against me. Any pain on that? Pain anterior shoulder. Oh, great. All right, now push up against me. That's all right? Yep. No pain there? Okay, push up against me. Now you would say that if we were doing a resisted movement and we were looking for pain, we'd be looking for it where? On this movement. Infraspinatus because we're doing what? But he's feeling it anteriorly again. Okay, let's see what we get on this side. <laughs> Probably nothing, but we'll test it anyway. All right, push up against me, Stuart. No. And one more. Okay, and again. Yeah, no problems with that, okay. So, his external rotation, once again, we've got positive signs. Okay, on his active, his passive, and also his resisted. So you're really coming out with the goods tonight. You've done well. <laughs> it's been a work in progress. Right, so the next step would be what? We've done his external rotators. We are going to do internal rotators, aren't we? Okay. Anyone got any good tips on how to test the internal rotation of the shoulder? We can do the opposite way. We can, absolutely. Hand behind the back. Hand behind the back. Love the hand behind the back. Tells me so much more than this. This is good, but, but 
hand behind the back tells us so much more. So let's, let, yeah, let's actually get you to stand up. Let's get profile this way. That's it. So now what I want Stuart to do is, I'm not doing a passive here, okay? So I'm getting him to, to bring his shoulder as far as he can round to his back and obviously up as well. So just do it again for us. Sorry if I'm in your way there. Okay. Okay. So spin around the other way. Drop that one down. Okay. And do this one for us. So what are we noticing when he does internal rotation? Can anyone pick Notice, anything? Um, a bit of loss of movement there. Yep. Scapular winging. Um, bit of scap winging, but more than that. What's actually, what's the glenohumeral doing? Scapula's not quite low. Okay. So All right, so I'll demonstrate. With his, yeah. with his good hand, with his good arm, I say. He puts his hand behind his back and his glenohumeral sits back nicely in neutral. Okay? When he does his internal rotation on these, oops, sorry, he drops it forward and down. He's doing this. Drops it drops down. Yep. And that means the scapulus uh, is actually gone down downwards too. Well, he's dropping his glenohumeral. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, right. definitely. So for me, in terms of... Oops, we'll now. So this indicates what? If he's having to bring the shoulder forward and down, he's getting what? He's getting anterior shortening. Okay, which, wow, that'd be surprising for a shoulder, wouldn't it? So the difference being for internal and external rotation is that he's actually tight in his external rotation, his passive range movement, but when he does his internal rotation, to do internal rotation, he's having to do what? Change his posture. Yeah, well, yeah, he's changing his posture. Yeah, most yeah. definitely. But he's having to have drop his shoulder down and forward and do what to his external rotators? Well, he's recruiting them to get his arm around as well. Okay. So, um, given that fact, let's just get a bit of an idea of terms of his internal rotation on... Resistive movement. Actually, let's spin around this way. The good one first. Yeah, we'll do the good one first. Thanks, Stuart. Good man. Okay, so we're going to you're going to come in, okay, in towards your body. <coughs> I'll keep thinking of a patient, so I'm going to treat you right one. Okay. <laughs> good. Okay. So just pushing into my yes. hand, just nice and. Okay. One more. Okay, and again. That's all right. Yep. No pain. No problems. Okay. Now I've got my arm in there. Why? Yeah. Try and do internal rotation, resisted internal rotation, with your elbow tucked into your side. Difficult because what happens is you push it out. Okay. All right. Now coming in. Okay. Any pain on that? Anterior. Anteriorly again. How's that? Go again. <laughs> How's that? Fine. Fine. Okay. Slight. Slightly there. Worse, okay. Worse, worse, worse. All right. Okay. So he's once again it's anterior. So it's it's you're consistent. It's anterior, anterior, anterior. All right. All right. Sit down there. Okay. So we've done flexion, abduction, internal, external yeah, rotations. Yeah. Any other range of movements we should look at? Extension. 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 Beautiful. I wonder what we're going to learn from extension. So let's get you to sit, but we will get you to turn facing that way for us, Stuart. Actually, we'll just move the whole seat. That'll be easier. Sit that way. So passive range of movement for extension for me means once again stabilising the shoulder, then bringing it up until he feels either pain or a stretch. So I'm testing what here? Elasticity. Yep. Of? Yeah. Yeah. Just let me know, Stuart. Whereabouts? Okay. Deep through there. So, there is biceps. So, we're checking for what? Biceps. <coughs> well, biceps restriction for a start, myofascially. Once again, you just let me know. 
So this is his bad side. What's going on here? Does that feel okay? Stretching out. Just getting a stretch. Bit of a difference? Huge difference. Huge difference. What's going on there? Okay, spin around to the front again for us. Now, I could do resisted extension. Um, however, just pushing against me. Okay, and again. Any pain on that? No. Go again. Okay, that's fine. Let's do the good side. Okay. Okay, and one more. Okay, nothing on that. No pain. No pain. Good. Right. Okay. So, for for assessment on in terms of his range of movement, we've so far got positives on just about every every range of movement, whether it be resisted, passive, or whatever. It's more than likely an anterior structure, given the fact of where he's feeling it, where he's being loaded, isn't it? Yes, no, maybe. Not 100% sure, are we? No. This is all good, these tests are great, but... Okay, so how do we distinguish now where his problem is? Palpation, beautiful. But before we do palpation, because that is the end result, that is the cream as far as I'm concerned, let's just do a couple of special tests in terms of loading up, say, supraspinatus. So everyone's familiar with um, empty can test? Actually, stand up for us, Stuart. Spin around this way. So empty can, everyone's familiar with it. A bit of abduction, horizontal flexion, and it's resisted. So let's start with, uh, that's the good side, isn't it, Stuart? So just gently pushing up against me. Build, 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 build. That all right? Yep. And this one here. Okay. Any pain on that? Okay. So you're <coughs> feeling it through the top here as well. So <coughs> what does that mean? He's got, well, no, not necessarily. He's got some supraspinatus irritation, I'd say. He's definitely got some. Let's take him into abduction and full internal rotation. Okay, I'm going to push down on this one. Yep. I want you to resist. That's okay. Yep. And this. Pain. Pain. Whereabouts. Okay, so he's getting pain and weakness anteriorly again. All right, sit down. So with, um, with did you mention impingement, Millie? Yes, yeah, okay. So how many of you are familiar, how many of you here have actually either treated someone with impingement or had impingement yourself, a true impingement syndrome. So the dynamics of impingement are what? Signs and symptoms of impingement would be sharp, catching, severe pain. Okay, so they go, oh, Jesus, oh, yep. Okay, right. that's right. But, but the difference being is that impingement usually only happens when you've irritated it. So if we sat here all night bludgeoning his supraspinatus and winding it up and getting him to paint the roof and all those sort of things, then he'll develop an impingement sign, okay? So I would say I've probably had 15 years of doing this, I've probably had two people come in who have actually had an impingement sign in clinic, all right? But they've had signs of impingement outside of clinic, all right? So Doing your empty can test or these impingement tests and not getting anything doesn't mean they don't have impingement, all right? So I, I really honestly believe that in terms of taking your subjective assessment, <coughs> always ask them, do they or have they had periods of sharp catching pain in their shoulder? That has been oh, yeah, severe of nature, sharp catching pain. I've had impingement and I still get it. So I know what the difference is, and that's why it's good sometimes to get some of these, these pathologies, because then you know what they're like, you know how they present and what the dynamics are. It's not good that I get impingement, but it makes me understand the condition a bit better. All right, all right, so he's got, um, he's got a little bit of, I would assume, maybe supraspinatus irritation, because if you can test, once again, It doesn't necessarily mean that we're overloading supraspinatus. Now, 
what we're going to do, a bit of chromioclavicular testing, so a bit of horizontal flexion. So because he's got anterior shoulder pain, this is an absolute must to do this, isn't it? Any pain on that? That's okay. So you're feeling compression. it compression in there, but not pain. Okay, all right. What about this side? Same sort of... Now, you, what we will notice is bringing his arm across so much more flexible. Or is it just me? No. no. So it's definitely loading there. So there's a chance his posterior capsule is really tight too. Geez, you're on your way. <laughs> okay. All right, so now the other thing that I want to test while I'm at it is I want to know, because I'm really interested in his hub scap, I really am. So I want to know what sort of ability he's got to, uh, to do the lift-off test. Is everyone familiar with the lift-off test? So it's, let's get you to spin around profile-wise again for us. Okay, so, yep. Yep, that's right, beautiful. Okay, so the idea is hand in the arch of the back, okay, and the ability to bring the hand off, okay, the back. All right, so just doing that for us. Let's come up with it there. Okay, coming off, not a problem. Okay, push against me. That's all right, no problems there. All right, back around that way. Now, any pain on doing that? Okay, that's all right. Can you go up a little bit further? You're struggling there, aren't you? Go back down a bit. Okay, now coming off for us. How's that feel? Sorry, I'm yep, okay, all right. And he's coming where? He's coming to about there. Right? Whereas on the other side, he can. Take it right off. Now you can try this yourself. Is, is everyone familiar with this test? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah, you could be doing that. Yeah, definitely. Yes, yes, by all means. All right, so that's for me now. That's all right, you can relax now, Stuart. For me now, just sit down there. My differential diagnosis. Okay, so at this point in time, because of I suppose the glowing thing that's really made a difference for me, because I would have been thinking, okay, biceps, subscap, and then maybe some pec minor coracobrachialis sort of involvement, okay? He's definitely got the teres minor and lat dorsi restriction, without a doubt. But they're the main group that I'd be looking at, okay? Now, I want to confirm it. What's confirmed or denied a little bit just for me, and this is my bias, that's why I'm up here, it's my bias. So you're more than, you're more than happy to challenge me on it too but is that his biceps range of movement, his passive range of movement was so good. If it was biceps orientated, he would have had restriction. If we've got irritation at the tendon, what happens to the belly of the muscle or what happens to the, the muscle itself? Usually it's short and tight, isn't it? But because he had such good range of movement on the affected side, that's, and now, well, and now he's also his sub-scat lift-off test as well. Okay, so I've collected this, the, the information given some of the ranges of movement and the resisted tests, and it's sort of like, yeah, it could be, yeah, it could be sub-scat, yeah, it could be this, it could be that. But in terms of trying to confirm or deny, I'm now thinking sub-scat definitely as the main culprit. But what do we do need to do now? Palpation, as you said before, okay. Absolutely palpation. How many of you palpate your clients? Like specifically put them down and actually palpate them. Not just treat, but go, is that tender there? Is that tender there? Is that tender there? How many of you do that? Oh, that's great. That is great, fantastic. Okay, because I would have thought that doesn't happen enough. And that's a bit of a shame, isn't it? Because why? Because we're pretty good at palpating. Out of all the practitioners out there that, tra that treat musculoskeletal, we probably palpate or have the opportunity to palpate more than the rest of them. And palpation, don't underestimate palpation, what it can tell us. So what we're going to do, Stuart, yep. um, just before we do that, we want to just quickly go through your neck range of movement. We'll do a structural assessment and then just see what's going on with that thoracic spine. Okay, so let's just do range of movement for his neck. So just dropping your chin down towards your chest. That's about as far as you can go. Yep. You feeling a pulling anywhere? Slight pulling right through the middle? 
Okay. If I wind it up, does it get a little bit more? Yep. Okay, all right. Okay, let's look at your rotation. So, see my finger over here? Yep. yep. Coming around as far as you can. All right, where do you feel that? This side or that side? That side. So, he's feeling it up here, just below the occiput. Okay. All right, around this way. Okay, whereabouts are you feeling that? Yeah, here. Yeah. Okay, so he's feeling it in Mr. SCM. Okay, good. Well, it's not good, but that's what it is, isn't it? Okay, so let's have a little bit of a lateral flexion. So dropping over here. Yep. Okay, all right. So here or here? Do you see what I'm saying? I'm saying here or here, meaning traps or SCM. Okay. Traps. Yeah. What about that there, Stuart? Okay, once again. All right. And the last one would be extension. Oh, flip top head. Okay. How does that feel? <laughs> Can you stay there for about 10 minutes? No. no. Okay. So any pain in the back? Yeah. The neck? Yeah. Or is it just compression? Okay, all right. How many people here love to do neck extension? I don't know. Anyway. Okay, so in terms of his range of movement for his neck, there's no doubt he's got some tight traps. He's got a tight right SCM, so that's going to be part of our treatment as well. Now, thoracic, the thoracic spine. How many of you assess the thoracic spine? Yep. Okay, so not many of you. So to do thoracic spine, let's get you to come and sit just on a table like this, all right? And we sit them that way because why? Because we don't want their pelvis to move, okay? Now thoracic spine, to assess, can be a bit tricky sometimes, depending on the person. So arms behind the back. Now we want to do, for flexion, how do we do thoracic flexion? Because we've got the ribs. Okay, this is lumbar flexion, isn't it? So thoracic flexion would be tucking in and down, okay? So you're dropping, collapsing your diaphragm, all right? So let's just get you to come down. Now, he's doing it actively. How's that feel, mate? It's fine. Any stretch, any feeling of pain, any? Um, stretch up higher in the thoracic area. Okay, so in this area yep. here. Okay, all right. Coming back up for us. Now, we want to get him to do rotation. Okay, so coming around. So actually put your arms across your heart. Beautiful. Across your arms. So coming around to your left first. All right. Now, when he gets around to here, I'm just going to add a little bit of overpressure. So you feeling any tightness? To the left. Okay, so he's feeling it down the left here. Okay. And then round back this way. <laughs> yeah, and it's not real great this way, but anyway. Um, oh, I'm not laughing at you, mate, sorry. Whereabouts are you feeling that? To the right. Okay, so he's feeling it on the right, okay. Now, the last one, which I find the most important one, is extension, thoracic extension. So arms behind the back again, up like so. So extension is lifting the elbows and bending the back not the lumbar spine. So put your hand on T12L1 and take him back until you feel, okay, that's about it there. Yeah. And that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty good thoracic extension, I imagine. Poor thoracic would be getting to here and then it's all lumbar extension. Right. So given that fact, I'd say, I wouldn't say that his thoracic spine is playing a big role in his shoulder problem. It will play a role, but not the role. Um, but we, we certainly will be treating it. Okay, so just last and finally, first rib. Does everyone know how to find the first rib? Anterior border of the traps here. Pull them back towards you and then go down. All right, that bone there is your first rib. All right, so you do it on yourselves. So you want to come away from the apex of your neck. All right, so it's yeah. over in this area here. So pull your 
sorry, pull, push your anterior or the anterior border of your traps back and then come straight down. That bone that you feel there is your first rib, okay? And first rib is important because why? Because who attaches to the first rib? Scalenes. Yeah, definitely. So for me with Stuart, that feels not too bad. He's fairly level. But always check it. Always check it. Because it may bring in that neurological component of shoulder pain. Scalenes, the pec minor, neurovascular structures, intertwining, going underneath. If they're involved, then there's a chance that you may have a neural component to your shoulder, okay? Especially if they're getting forearm pain. All right. Uh, so that's a, f yes, yeah, sorry. Yep. When you're palpating back here in that first rib, yep. Down, they do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you're not you're not assessing scalenes, just the f the first rib. If it's high on that side, then the scalenes could be shortened and tight. Yeah. That, yep. Sorry, I should have elaborated. Okay. Um, all right. So look, that's where we're at now. Another little test that I've once again, this is my bias. Um, and it's more so just for pec minor. And how important do you reckon pec minor is for the shoulder? I, should, I think you just should just treat it on every shoulder problem, you know, because it's just worth the checklist. So find the, where the pec minor attaches, the coracoid process, isn't it? Onto the coracoid process. Now, take the shoulder and do a bit of horizontal flexion. So bringing the shoulder back, and then what I'm doing here, what I'm, sorry, what I'm feeling for is when I'm starting to feel a pull, okay, on that pec minor attachment. So I'm getting it about there. Right. Now, this may, it took me ages to, uh, to do this, but um, I always do it. And I, I, I can't say that it's, it's a highly um, specific test or in terms of its sensitivity either. So see how far I'm coming back on this side now? So I'm starting to get a pull about there. So there's a little bit of difference. And it, once again, it's just the ability to see whether or not pec mitre might be tight and short. But look, as I said, show me someone who doesn't have a tight, you know, short pec mitre. It just, it really does depend on the, yeah, the, the amount of tightness too. All right, so now we're, um, we're at a point where we can start doing our palpation, I think. So for me, um, the area that I want to palpate <coughs> first is his anterior shoulder. I want to know whether or not it is actually his biceps tendon or it's his subscap. Now, if it's his biceps, I'm going to get him to, sorry, I'll get Stuart to push up against me. Okay, now just hold it there, don't try and push any, just like a, yeah, that's it. So I'm feeling for his long head of biceps. All right, now relax. So how does that feel there? It's fine. That's all right? Yeah. That feels okay there, all right. So right next to his biceps tendon is the attachment for subscap. That's where you subscap, yep, subscapularis. Uh, medial. medial, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's tender. It's going to be tender because it's an attachment side, isn't it? All right. All right. Can you just put your arm behind your back? Sorry. So now I'm going to do supraspinatus, anterolaterally. Okay. How does that feel? It's tender. That's tender. Yeah. All right. Back through here, put your arm that way. Now I'm going to come into the, the posterior component of the rotator cuff, which is infraspinatus. Okay, what's that like? Very tender. 
very tender. Okay, so we've got sensitivity, and you probably are going to have sensitivity at most of these, but it's the degree of sensitivity. What I got from him was that's the spot. That's where I feel it for subscap. So for me, I'm sold on that. So that's where my direction's going, okay? Now, we can do, obviously, palpation of his upper traps. Do you ever get anyone who's not tender in their upper traps? Of, no, it doesn't happen. Well, if it does, they're unique. <laughs> okay. So just feeling the tone, the sensitivity of the upper traps, because that holds everything. Now, there's one thing that I haven't done in terms of assessing his shoulder. Can anyone pick it up yet? That's... No, well, well, yeah, I mean, that, that is important, but it's in every textbook. You learnt it. Scapulohumeral rhythm, isn't it? Can you stand up and turn around? How many of you here <coughs> can assess scapulohumeral rhythm really well? <laughs> okay, so just, yeah, facing that way. I can sit there for hours watching people do this. Uh, sort of go, yeah, 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 I think that one. No, that's the shoulder you got problem. Oh, because that one doesn't look real good. So, look, unless you are, unless you are spent hours looking at people's scapulae humeral rhythm, I find that, and that's great if you can, you can pick it up and you see the elevation with a little bit more rotation, great, terrific. But for me, I like to take the static picture and just get a bit of an idea if there is a difference. So for a start, if he has a problem with his rotator cuff muscles, it starts where? It starts with his scap stabilisers. It starts with the muscles that support the scapula, okay? So for a start, I want to know if he can actually contract them, all right? So can you push your medial border of your scap into my hand or into my thumb. Okay. Yep. Can you hold that? Yep. Okay. Good. Do it again. Okay. Good. Now, can you push the inferior angle into my finger? Okay. Good. Great. Now, can you push in, hold, and push down? Great. Now, that's good. He can do it. There's a lot of people who come through your door that don't. Yeah. They can't even recruit that. They may be able to recruit retraction, but they won't be able to do depression. Don't or they can't do either or either. Okay. Okay. So if that's the case, all our treatment's going to be what? Yeah, for sure. But it's going to be futile if this isn't working. Okay, so the first port of call, if we want to change the dynamics, the biomechanics of the way his glenohumeral moves, we need to have this switching on and working properly. And we can massage till the cows come home and we ain't going to get a change, honestly. Well, we will get a change, sorry, but it'll be relief as opposed to, hopefully, some resolution. And it's, it's simple. All you're doing is you're getting them to see if they can recruit these on. And then obviously if they're, if they're, if they're athletes where they're, it's a throwing shoulder, then they need to take it further. They need to do then the specific switching on scap stabilisers, then doing their rotator cuff exercises. I don't know how many people I've seen doing rotator cuff exercises but can't even do their scap stabilisers. So they're out there going, eh, da -da -da -da, and they're not even recruiting their scap stabilisers. So what do you think is going to happen to your rotator cuff muscles? They become overloaded. They're not, they're not designed for all these shoulder movements. They're intimate small muscles. And when they get painful, they become highly irritable. And the nine times out of ten, it's because their scap stabilisers aren't working. It's in all the literature. So we need to take that into consideration. Now, if you're not confident in assessing your scap stability, then you need to refer off to someone who is, okay? No, I don't care if it's a chiro, whether it's an osteo, whether it's a physio, whether it's an exercise physiologist or someone you have a good relationship at the gym. But that has to be an essential part of what you're doing, okay? So getting them to switch that on, okay? 